index, how investors and companies can unlock the benefits of immunization for the poor. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by the Access to Medicine Foundation, the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, and the Principles for Responsible Investment. My name is Sarah Margolis, and I'm an Associate Program Director with the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, or ICCR. On behalf of our organization, I want to welcome you to today's discussion. ICCR is a coalition of faith and values-driven organizations who view the management of their investments as a powerful catalyst for social change. Our membership comprises nearly 300 organizations, including faith-based institutions, socially responsible asset management companies, unions, pension funds, and colleges and universities that collectively represent over $200 billion in invested capital. Viewing accessible and affordable health care as a universal right, for 20 years ICCR members have been advocating for the equitable access and affordability of life-saving medicines in emerging markets where poor public health exerts downward pressure on the economy. From pandemic diseases to neglected tropical diseases and non-communicable diseases, ICCR members engage leading pharmaceutical companies in an effort to reduce the disease burden borne by these communities and to promote value-creating behavior and innovative health programs to help resolve some of the world's most intractable diseases. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights make clear companies' responsibility to respect, protect, and remedy human rights within their global supply chains. The pharmaceutical industry has a pivotal role to play in protecting the human right to health by promoting the access, availability, affordability, and infrastructure required to deliver life-saving medicines where they're most needed. The Access to Medicine Index, and now the Access to Vaccines Index, provides critical information to investors. ICCR members have used the information provided to evaluate the progress of the companies in which they invest. The Access to Vaccines Index, which we are discussing today, provides an important new benchmark against which we can measure corporate measure progress corporate to make critical vaccines available to the most vulnerable. We are glad to co-host this forum to discuss the Access to Vaccines Index in detail, as well as how investors can use this information. Now, I will turn things over to Allison Bisco from the Principles for Responsible Investment. Great, thank you, Sarah. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. Uh, I will be the moderator for today's discussion. As Sarah mentioned, I work at the Principles for Responsible Investment as a project manager, overseeing action our signatories are taking on a wide range of environmental, social, and governance issues. For anyone on the webinar who is not familiar with the PRI, we are a UN support investor network with over 1,700 investor members. By signing the principles, each of our signatories commits to integrating environmental, social and governance factors into their investment decision-making processes. Health as an investment issue has become much more prevalent in recent years. The PRI's collaboration platform, an online tool for our signatories to collaborate on ESG topics, has seen an increase in engagement activity among signatories on the topic, taking several different forms. These engagements have ranged from sending a petition to the FDA on drug labeling, an investor statement, the link between sugar, obesity, and non-communicable diseases, and increasingly engagement around the use of antibiotics in livestock supply chains. We have also seen more and more shareholder resolutions covering health-related issues, ranging from junk food advertising to drug pricing. Investor interest in access to medicine has been particularly strong, with 60 investors representing over $5.5 trillion in assets under management signing a statement supporting the Access to Medicine Index. The PRI therefore welcomes this Access to Vaccines Index, which we hope investors can use as a tool to hold companies to account on their global immunization targets, and we also hope it can unlock new investment opportunities in the pharmaceutical sector. So before I introduce our first speaker for today's webinar, I just wanted to remind participants that this webinar is being recorded. Participants are encouraged to ask questions and can do so by typing their question in the Q&A panel or by clicking the raise hand icon. So without further ado, our first speaker is Jay Iyer, who is the Executive Director at the Medicine Foundation. Jay,
Hello. Hello. Allison, it seems you muted yourself. Maybe we should move well, on. Yes. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for giving me an opportunity to speak to you about the Access to Vaccines Index. Um, so I think I'm just going to wait for my first slide to show on my screen. I think you can see a purple blue screen on. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the Access to Vaccines Index that we were launching. Uh, we launched in February, uh, and I'll give you a glimpse into how vaccine companies are responding to calls for greater immunization coverage. Uh, my name is Jay Iyer. I lead the Access to Medicine Foundation, and this is a research uh, um, that we've done in conjunction with uh, several pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and I'll give you a bit of a glimpse into our organization in a couple of minutes. Next slide. So the foundation is basically an independent organization that's based in the Netherlands. We do perform research on and incentivize uh, pharmaceutical companies to improve access to medicine, specifically in low middle income countries. Uh, we're in independent and a non-profit organization. Uh, we're supported by governments such as those that you see below, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, UK aid, um, along with charities such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And for the Vaccines Index, we're su especially supported by a scheme called the National Postcode Lottery in the Netherlands. Um, and we take a multi-stakeholder approach to our work. Next slide. Our primary uh, publications have centered around the Access to Medicine Index, which many of you may have already heard of. Uh, it provides an evaluation and a ranking of the top 20 research-based pharmaceutical companies and their efforts in improving access to medicine in 107 low-middle-income countries over 50 diseases. Um, we're currently also in the process of uh, starting an AMR benchmark to look at antimicrobial resistance. And here we'll be looking at uh, the multinational research-based pharmaceutical industry, biotechnology industry, and the generic medicine manufacturers in their efforts to combat AMR. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking to you about access to vaccines index, which I'll introduce in a couple of minutes. But we are also involved in various thematic studies uh, to reflect a little bit about the main areas that uh, the pharmaceutical industry can play a role in. And here we go in depth into key topics such as hepatitis C, uh, we, got, we recently published uh, last week uh, Access to Cancer Control, where we built a landscape on uh, cancer uh, control partnerships and interventions from the pharmaceutical industry in low middle income countries. And uh, my team and I are, are often in various different venues advancing the debate. Um, we also ensure that our findings are used by various different stakeholders uh, in their conversations and their discussions to help move the needle along in improving access to medicine. Next slide, please. So the way we actually work is uh, we, we tend to use a multi-stakeholder approach uh, to incentivize the pharmaceutical industry. Firstly, we try to understand what do we reasonably expect from the industry to, to do on, on key topics like access to medicine and access to vaccines. We use this tool to then create um, a system where pharmaceutical company information and data can be used to evaluate how far a pharmaceutical company is, is in their path towards um, achieving a better progress and greater progress. And what, the way we typically do is our publications are intended to track and demonstrate progress made by the pharmaceutical industry. We try to create a non-financial incentive uh, for corporate action, and we try to empower um, internal change makers. These are individuals who work within companies who come up with the ideas and have to implement these ideas in low middle income countries. We also try to unleash the involvement of investors, a key group of uh, stakeholders that are involved very early in uh, the pharmaceutical decision-making processes. And we try to identify incentives and barriers for engagement uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and between the pharmaceutical industry and their, and their partners. And we support the many other initiatives that are there in the path towards greater access to medicine. Next slide, please. Um, I think we've spoke a little bit earlier um, about uh, the various different stakeholders that play an important role in access to medicine. Here, this slide shows you the about 60 investors uh, that have signed and endorsed the principles of the Access to Medicine Foundation. They represent a, a growing voice uh, among uh, investors who believe in, in social responsibility, believe that pharmaceutical industry is, is core and can be part of the, the solution to improving greater access to medicine. Um, here, I'd like to also tell you a bit more about the history uh, of why we decided to start an Access to Vaccines Index. 
um, we and why investors uh, care about this particular topic and why they, they should find it important here to, to engage in this topic. Um, we know that um, vaccines are pretty much the fastest growing um, area in, and we see this in several different oh, pharmaceutical, sorry, excuse me. We see this in several different um, businesses. Uh, for example, GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi have reported uh, growth in the last year. Um, GlaxoSmithKline vaccine unit uh, has uh, reported growth of um, more than 1 billion um, for the first quarter and have generated more than 1 billion um, US dollars for the first quarter. And that outperforms pharmaceutical sales and consumer health uh, sectors. Sanofi has also uh, demonstrated and shown that there is an 8.8% increase compared to last year, beating the Sanofi's consumer healthcare, general medicines, emerging uh, markets, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular units, all fast growing areas. And we know that vaccines are in a way, big pharma's um, fastest selling products, um, the top seller uh, of, of companies like Pfizer are not um, uh, classic uh, products that if you ask anyone, but um, the fastest selling product over here is uh, Prevna, which generates revenues of up to 6 billion in the last year. So this, is, this brings you to a point where, you know, we know that vaccines are cost effective. We know that vaccines present um, tremendous public health value. And it is important that investors engage in this issue and um, discuss with pharmaceutical companies their interventions, their ideas in, in going forward. So if you move to the next slide, I'll introduce the Access to Vaccines Index. So a couple of years ago, we decided to embark on the project on Access to Vaccines Index. And here we decided to evaluate the top vaccine manufacturers uh, in, in their work on improving access to vaccines. We, of course, recognize here the relevance of other stakeholders, such as governments and the patients uh, and people themselves in ensuring that vaccination uh, coverage is, is, is complete and mothers um, ensure that their the children uh, come for vaccines and uh, take the full course of vaccines. Next slide, please. When we thought about why it was important for us to bring forward an access to vaccines index, a few main reasons come to mind. Um, I already spoke about the success and the cost effectiveness of vaccines to protect billions of people from disease. Um, there's also a, a key link to each successful vaccinations to vaccine companies who were responsible for innovating the vaccines, coming up with the key characteristics and also ensuring that they are made accessible in key markets. The, this is the first public benchmark that maps industry action. And our hope is that it stimulates vaccine companies to improve their practices, to see where they stand among their peers and um, in response to, to stakeholder views. And it also helps to uncover where more action is needed and where companies themselves face barriers to greater action. And this, this action here can be, of course, uh, made by the pharmaceutical industry, the vaccine industry, uh, and their key partners, and also by governments, uh, donors, uh, and, and implementing uh, uh, NGOs. Next slide, please. So I won't be able today to go into the depth of the report. Uh, we have a highly extensive report that goes into each, in, uh, each company's performance and uh, the performance of multiple uh, companies in, in the space. It's the first industry landscape. We've put forward three main findings uh, uh, that reflect, again, the three areas uh, that we're focusing on that I'll get to in a few minutes. We've also put forward two cross-cutting analyses um, looking at emerging infectious diseases and, uh, and different areas there, and three research areas. And we have eight dedicated company report cards that, uh, that talk about the main um, results from each of the companies that we have evaluated. Next slide. We've had a tremendous amount of response already from the time to launch now. Here I can show you a snapshot of different companies um, and stakeholder responses to the, to the vaccine index, saying the importance of benchmarking, saying the importance of tracking progress and making progress towards greater access to vaccines. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, yes, thank you. So, and, and here we talk about the importance of media. Uh, the media tries to bring forward the, um, the, the, the views that, that various different stakeholder groups uh, represent here in educating um, regular people in the importance of, of vaccine access. 
the importance of the results in, in, in business and uh, the importance of some of the results that we brought forward in, in which are the leading companies that are making efforts to improve access to vaccines. Next slide, please. Our main areas of, of research here are in three uh, distinct groups. Firstly, we look at research and development. Here we look at areas such as investments, the size and, and value of the, of the research and development pipeline, and how companies facilitate access. We look at pricing and registration. We look at the strategy, transparency, and how companies take registration uh, decisions into account. And the third area, which is often not very represented in other public documents, uh, is in manufacturing and supply. Here we see how companies overcome local barriers, how they ensure rational use, respond to shortages, find a way to align supply and demand and support uh, vaccine uh, security and global manufacturing capacity uh, to be increased when in, in times of uh, need. Um, our work over here looks at preventative vaccines specifically. We've evaluated eight companies and there are about 69 diseases in 107 low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Now we know that the vaccine industry is highly consolidated. Uh, this figure here shows um, the diversity uh, and the various different business models employed by, by multiple companies. And you can see here that uh, companies vary in the approach uh, to invest in research and development on the left side and the size uh, and reach of the portfolios on the right side. So for example, you see that Johnson & Johnson uh, has a relatively lower revenue from compared to some of the peers that are represented here, but invests he heavily in vaccine pipelines. And on the right side, you see that the, a company that has a high number of doses sold globally and uh, for a low revenue is a company like Serum Institute of India. And I encourage you to, of course, read uh, page 13 of our, of our reports to get more information associated with this particular figure. Next slide. I wanted to uh, spend some time here to tell you a bit about some of the key incentives that we've discovered um, in our work that really drives pharmaceutical, uh, the pharma vaccine industry's engagement on access to vaccines. Um, three main projects here come to mind, um, and we illustrated this in the report. The first is the meningitis vaccine project, where we saw uh, organizations like WHO, PASS, Serum Institute India, and, and the African public health uh, system um, Develop, to develop an affordable meningitis A vaccine for use in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a, really built in response to a large public health need paired with the low commercial potential of a vaccine. The second example that we speak about in our report is um, an advanced malaria vaccine candidate uh, called RTSS or Muscurix. And it's sort of developed through a public private partnership between GSK and the Path Malaria Vaccine Initiative and, and through funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, the third area that I speak about here is the advanced market commitment. Um, and this is for specifically used in pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. And this is a mechanism for which donors commit funds to guarantee the price of the vaccines once they have been developed. And in turn, companies commit to providing affordable vaccines in the long term. And this kind of incentivizes uh, vaccine uh, producers to accelerate the development of vaccines uh, to meet the needs of poorer countries scale up production and encourage uptake through predictable pricing of countries and manufacturers. Next slide, please. Now, today we can also celebrate the recent approvals that have been uh, made. Uh, several vaccines have entered the market, including uh, the first ever dengue vaccine by, by Sanofi. Um, and uh, several other vaccines here. You'll see here new vaccines like the Den Denverix We'll see here vaccines um, that have improved presentations like, like Giardacil 9 for, for human papilloma virus. And some of them are also label updates, which help uh, adherence and usage of vaccines in, in low middle income countries. Next slide. When we look at company performance, of course, we see a mixed bag. Uh, we see um, in increased performance, well, we see performance uh, related to uh, research and development here, pricing and registration and manufacturing and supply. And here we see um, companies that are doing particularly well in research development. We see companies like uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, and Sanofi uh, doing particularly well compared to their peers in pricing and registration with, uh, with, improved, uh, with demonstrations of, the, of transparency, uh, registration coverage, um, and other metrics. We see here GlaxoSmithKline, Merck Co, and Sanofi performing really well. 
and manufacturing supply, where we primarily look at uh, the areas that I spoke about in aligning supply and demand, we again see GlaxoSmithKline, uh, we see Merck and Co. and Sanofi performing really well. And the reasons for, uh, for performance uh, being uh, well in, in these particular areas and the areas where companies can still improve is very well described in our, in our report. So I encourage you to, to, to read the rest of uh, this section and also reach out to us if you're uh, working with or engaging with any particular company to understand better uh, why they are performing in this particular area, um, how, how they can do better and, and which areas we can support their, their positive growth. Next slide, please. So if I go into uh, one area that we can uh, spend some time on, the Access to Vaccines Index, uh, first look at the research and development pipeline, which is very relevant. Next slide. We see the biggest pipelines in vaccine uh, development coming from GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson and Sanofi. And surprisingly, most of the vaccine candidates are in phase two or later in clinical development. Out of 69 diseases and pathogens that are covered by our report, we see um, about 89 research development products, uh, projects um, in the pipeline. And several of these projects aim at adapting existing vaccines, expanding approved uses, uh, along with some new uh, vaccines in the pipeline. Um, surprisingly, at least 10 of the projects have moved from discovery uh, of preclinical to clinical phases uh, within the last two years. Um, in this, we see several projects such as uh, uh, projects for respiratory syncytial virus um, and several combination vaccines. Uh, and these provide a, a, a huge resource for understanding what the next generation vaccines are that's going to be reaching the market in the next few years. Um, most attention is paid for diseases such as pneumococcal diseases, um, HPV, seasonal influenza, meningococcal disease, and RSV, and that really stands out over, over some of the other diseases, uh, disease areas itself. And this reflects um, both the commercial incentives that companies recognize and the need for improvements in existing vaccines and, and uh, uh, as the areas where the most attention is, is given. Next slide. When you look at adaptations to existing vaccines, um, they account for over half of the vaccine R&D projects. Uh, several adaptations here are, um, are uh, notable. Uh, for example, um, Serum Institute of India is looking at a 10 valent uh, pneumococcal vaccine for PCV that covers all serotypes in uh, over 70% of people affected by pneumococcal disease. Uh, there's various, various thermostable vaccine uh, being developed, uh, one of which is um, a thermostable a version of uh, RTSS by GlaxoSmithKline. Um, and also there's been, there's been a revived interest in uh, controlled temperature change and uh, temperature stability and CTC label updates uh, within the research development pipeline. At the bottom of this slide, you can also see um, the type of vaccine adaptations that companies are active in, multivalency, temperature stability, pediatric population, um, are, are several of the areas where you see attention. Next slide. When you look at the vaccines in the pipeline, uh, we are encouraged to see that access plans are in place for over 50% of the vaccines in late stage development. And this gives us the confidence that when vaccines actually reach the market, they will be quickly implemented in, uh, vac in, in immunization programs and uh, reach a lot of people in time. Um, a lot of these vaccine um, access plans cover things like price commitments. For example, uh, Merck & Co. has, uh, um, ha for the Ebola vaccine, has an advanced pur purchase commitment. And GlaxoSmithKline has uh, committed to a particular price range for RTSS. And, and, he, and we also have other areas such as registration um, commitments, uh, such as that from Johnson & Johnson, um, for uh, some of their candidate vaccines in several uh, sub-Saharan African countries and Asian countries. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. So I'll now switch into the last area which I'll be able to speak about with the interest of time. Uh, we have been reevaluating uh, the companies um, and how, what kind of approaches they take to align supply with demand. We know in, with increasing um, public health uh, needs uh, coming into play, and with growing populations uh, and with the rise of certain infectious diseases, it is more and more important that companies try to come up with ways uh, to ensure that they, uh, they can match the, the, the demand that's gonna be increasing for, for vaccines. Some of the key elements that we looked for um, are described here on the left side of the slide, such as commitments, um, 
timely supply demand processes, uh, whether the companies are looking at reserve stocks, uh, scaling up production and processes there. And on the right side of the slide, we show the companies that have, made, have managed to show us uh, evidence that they are looking at these particular issues. Um, if a dot uh, is represented for GlaxoSmithKline, it shows that they have demonstrated to us that they are looking at commitments to ensure access in case of shortages um, and um, in and, and certain areas. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you also see uh, areas such as commitments to ensure supply of vaccines, especially in terms of staying in vaccine markets where there's needed, um, and a commitment to communicate plans to relevant stakeholders such as governments and the populations um, in order to reduce supply externally. So um, I think I won't be able to go into the rest of the results of the, of the, of the, of the Access to Vaccines Index because it's really quite extensive, but I'd like to leave you with a thought in the last slide here. Um, here I've given you a, a, an image of uh, some of the most successfully registered vaccines in the market. Um, here you see key vaccines are filed for registration in about 23% uh, of the countries on average. So there's a long, long way to go in terms of, of, of companies' uh, vaccines and where they're registered. And registration plays an important role in ensuring vaccine coverage is, uh, is there. Um, for example, in the area of, um, let's pick one, in the area of pneumococcal disease, Prevna 13 and Synflorix are two vaccines on the market. And GlaxoSmithKline has uh, registered um, the, uh, this, this product in 52 uh, countries compared to Pfizer in 11 countries. And this gives you, it gives you an understanding of the companies um, really uh, playing a role in, in improving access to, to vaccines. It tells you here, um, it also demonstrates here that um, a wide adop adoption of vaccines. It gives you a good indication of how important vaccines for these diseases are for safeguarding public health and companies can play an important role here. And this also shows you where success can be had. The companies that actually file for registration in, in, in larger numbers of countries will be more successful in reaching uh, patient populations and making an impact with their vaccines. So um, I hope today I've given you a, a brief overview. Um, with the interest of time, I've given you a very brief overview of some of our work. As I said, our report is available online and my team is of course ready to answer any questions and comments you have, and I hope you uh, engage with the pharmaceutical industry, the vaccine industry, various different stakeholders uh, that are um, relevant for national immunization programs as you read our work. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jay, for that great uh, overview of the Access to Vaccines Index. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in already, actually, but in the interest of time, I think um, we'll save those to the end. So moving swiftly on to our next speaker, who is Lauren Compare. Lauren is the Managing Director and Director of Shareholder Engagement at Boston Common Asset Management. So Lauren, over to you. Um, great. Thanks, Alison. Um, I, I want to say uh, that there is definitely a business case for, for looking at specifically um, one of the faster growing um, aspects of, of pharmaceutical companies' growth. Um, as, a, as an investor, we've actually been engaging pharmaceutical companies on access strategies for more than 15 years, including um, our, our, um, <clears throat> our uh, esteemed colleagues from JSK and J&J &J today. I, I think in terms of the use of the index, um, the access to vaccine index actually provides some really good guidance and very specific guidance on where current uh, innovation is in terms of R&D and, and, and practice from the pharmaceutical companies where further progress needs to be made and, and frankly, where there's current unmet need. And, and um, in fact, one of the most striking figures I came across and I think is highlighted in the report that more than two people, um, around, two billion people around the world don't even have access to basic vaccines. Um, we know that in terms of looking at um, uh, uh, cost, um, the most uh, cost-effective intervention is actually vaccines, and I would even go so far as to say that they're a basic building block for capturing the potential growth, both current and future growth, in low and lower uh, middle-income countries, um, such as India. Um, you know, uh, Jay also mentioned vaccines um, and, and the role that they play in tackling antimicrobial resistance, um, which I don't know if you've seen the figures, but it's estimated to cost global GBT GDP growth more than $1 billion by 2050 if not addressed. I would say in order to take advantage of all these estimated sustainable development gro goal, uh, growth opportunities in these markets, you need to address the basic need, um, such as preventative care and vaccines have a critical role to play there. 
There are certainly growth opportunities presented by the unmet need, um, which we've also heard from um, in terms of basic vaccines. There's high volume kind of low cost um, business models that you can look at. Um, we think for basic vaccines, that's important. And of course, you know, when we're talking about specialty diseases, um, those are best done in partnership and, and, and maybe uh, both the companies can talk a little bit about this. Maybe uh, a few more kind of facts and figures to provide a little bit of context. Um, in, in fact, if you look at the health spend in low and lower middle income countries, it's increasing as is the population. So there really is, um, I think there's an estimated between low income and lower middle income countries, 3.65 billion uh, people. And if you look at the average year on year growth um, in terms of health spend um, per capita, um, it's uh, it's it's between uh, 6.5 and, and 7.6 in those countries. Wanted to take a little bit of a, um, a, a, of a, a, a hyper focus or a little bit of a focus, um, especially in childhood vaccination. Um, when you look at something like maybe the latest three vaccines um, that have been uh, shown to be uh, really uh, effective in kind of reducing uh, childhood uh, more. Uh, mortality. Uh, you know, you're looking at the H influenza type B vaccine, pneumococcal um, vaccine, and the rotavirus vaccine. And uh, I came across some very interesting figures um, that have been done by, by some agencies. In fact, if you looked at achieving highest coverage for those three vaccines in a place like India, um, the introduction of the childhood um, rotavirus vaccine is projected to save 21 million in treatment costs per year. So a lot of avoidance, um, a lot of avoidance or, um, or averted treatment costs. And then if you look at over a 10 year period, uh, the averted cost of treatment for pneumococcal and H influenza could be as high as 1.5 billion just in that market. Um, if you look at the BRIC countries generally, the, um, these emerging um, economies, there are 239 uh, million children under the age of five, so there's a great unmet need in many, in many cases. And um, if you again look at you know, adding to GDP growth, the value of a life saved in a lower middle income country is estimated at 1.5 times the country's GDP per capita. capita sorry. Um, I would say, you know, in looking at um, the current index um, and, and what it's saying, I, I think, uh, you know, it's really important to kind of lay out um, how you can achieve um, sustainable growth where there are really commercial growth opportunities and, and how those models uh, play out. Um, if you look at if you look at the meeting kind of the unmet need, I think there does need to be, um, there's clearly a gap in um, registration, which um, Jay-Z already talked about. There, there is a, a more nuanced uh, pricing model approach that needs to be taken, um, including um, really looking at the lower middle income countries' ability to pay, um, and not just focusing on Gavi um, eligible countries. And, uh, you know, really looking at how um, access strategies are embedded from the very start in terms of vaccine development, and that is something that we've talked about um, in, in the general concept of access strategies with pharmaceutical companies. I would say, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good information and very specific information on the companies themselves in terms of providing some best practice examples, which is really important uh, when you're engaging other companies, um, as well as um, you know specific areas where we could see um, some greater progress. And so um, again, the index itself provides um, some very practical information and, and frankly, a roadmap um, for where we need to go in this sector. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lauren. Great to hear the investor perspective. We'll now be hearing from our first company speaker, uh, GSK. So we have two speakers from GSK. The first is Guy Pickles, Senior Manager for Global Health Vaccines, and John Pender, Vice President, Government Affairs and Global Health. So over to you both. Thanks very much. It's uh, John Pender here. Um, I'll try and just—I'm just, just going to give a, a, a short introduction and a, a high-level overview to uh, GSK's approach. Leave as much time as, as possible for a conversation uh, at the end. Um, GSK, as many people know, is pursuing a strategy based on the twin imperatives of innovation and access. 
Simply put, this means we invest in the research and development to discover and develop medicines and vaccines to meet unmet needs. And we then seek a return on that investment and measure our commercial success by providing access to those products for as many people as possible. And, and nowhere is this strategy more clearly seen um, than in our vaccines business, which uh, has been pursuing a tiered uh, pricing approach to try and maximize access um, for nearly 30 years now uh, and reflecting the, the, uh, the unique nature of the vaccines business. For us, this isn't about philanthropy, but it's a new way of sustainably doing business. GSK also uh, takes a progressive approach in tackling many other uh, healthcare challenges um, facing us, whether that's around access generally, whether it be around biopreparedness, um, R&D for diseases of the developing world, uh, working partnerships or antimicrobial resistance, as we've heard. And actually, vaccines play a key role in all of these uh, challenges, in addressing all of these uh, challenges. Um, so our approach has, has led to us doing well in the Access to Medicines Index um, every time it's been published. We're pleased to have uh, led that every time. And to take forward some of the best practices in uh, the latest uh, edition of the Access to Medicines Index, in January in Geneva, we um, helped convene with Save the Children and IFPMA an event uh, called Access to Medicines from Ranking to Action, Scaling Up Good Practice, which was held at the Graduate Institute. And the purpose of that event was to really um, firstly give companies a chance to showcase some of the best practices um, that uh, had been illustrated and, uh, and identified by the index, but then to have a discussion about how we could scale those up, how we could ensure those become the norm, um, how we can inc uh, encourage more companies to go further on that. So we've, we've uh, produced a report on that particular meeting, uh, which includes a, an appendix of seven key findings where we think uh, the most impact can be made. So if anybody hasn't seen that report, um, please let us know and we can, um, we can all send you a copy of that. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Guy, who can talk specifically about uh, our vaccines business and um, how we performed in the index. We're not hearing you, Guy, if you're speaking. Are you hearing me now? Yep. Okay, apologies for that. Um, uh, Guy Pickles from the GSK Vaccines Organization. So I'll, just, I'll firstly just give some context about our vaccines business, um, and then in particular touch on uh, our activities around two key themes of uh, innovation and then of access, which I think are pulled through in the, the three performance areas of the uh, index. So firstly, uh, we, uh, GSK Vaccines, have one of the broadest portfolios of any vaccine company in the world, um, enabling us to tackle even more of the world's diseases from, from pneumococcal disease, as has been mentioned, uh, to meningitis, hepatitis, um, rotavirus. And in fact, four in 10 of the world's children are immunized against at least one serious disease with a GSK vaccine. Um, and, and there's currently over 40 vaccines in our current portfolio for people of, of all ages. Um, this comes with responsibility, um, and this is the reason uh, GSK, as John has mentioned, have, have a commitment to access, uh, meaning that around 70% of those vaccines that we produced last year were delivered to least developed low and middle income countries. At the same time, uh, this has to be a sustainable business, and as you'll notice if you've seen the Access to Vaccines Index, and I'll point you towards the GSK report card as a, as a way of orienting yourself to GSK's work in this space, um, but not only are we leading the uh, access uh, indicators around the ATVI, which we were, we were very pleased to see, but actually among the companies compared in the index, GSK's vaccine division also accounts for the highest share of the company's overall revenue. Um, so as John said, this, this isn't philanthropy. Our, our vaccine business is central to the performance of the GSK group. Um, and to the point around um, GSK's performance in Q1, just, just a point to say actually uh, to look at the full year for vaccines can be more helpful because it, it, as a nature of the tender business in vaccines, performance can be lumpy over the year. Um, and then just to refer to the point around um, 
the changing population, as Lauren has, has touched on. Um, as demand for, for vaccines continues to grow, I think uh, the world's population grows and changes, and um, GSK needs to continue to, to grow and be profitable within that in order to continue to deliver uh, increasing volumes and, and new vaccines um, uh, in innovative areas. And that brings us to the first theme, I think, just to briefly touch on innovation across the, the performance areas. Um, being able to invest in innovation is, is critical to continue uh, to improve the health outlook for children um, and all age groups uh, to tackle new and emerging infections um, that could, in fact, threaten the gains made. Um, and I think the Access to Vaccines Index recognises GSK's pipeline as the largest. Um, that's the largest within the scope of the of the ATVI, which is, of course, a specific scope around diseases that have a particular impact in the developing world. Um, and, and GSK's pipeline is targeting all seven of the WHO priority diseases. Um, but I think an important point within the, the index is the recognition that innovation is not just about new vaccines, but also about new technologies um, for packaging uh, and deliver, uh, enabling a greater access to be delivered to existing vaccines. Um, for example, uh, the multi-dose file presentations that, that GSK has been working on requiring less supply chain uh, space and therefore enabling um, greater capacity uh, to afford greater access to hard to reach areas. Um, and from an R&D perspective, I think it's important to note that we uh, are leveraging and learning from the technologies across all of our vaccines, whether those being developed um, for one age group or another. And I think uh, the, the adjuvant system used in our malaria vaccine is an example of that, which you'll also find in our shingles vaccine um, in development. So doing good business and innovating and, and doing well for the world can, can achieve um, long-term sustainable growth is an, an important aspect. Um, and just to move briefly to, to the access element of, of the existing vaccines we have, which is also an important point to be recognized in the index, um, that the, the work we do in research is in vain if the vaccines that we develop don't reach uh, those people who need them. Um, and so innovation really matters when it enables us to turn the science into vaccines that help people around the world. And as has been touched on, that's why uh, we've, as pulled out in the, the index, um, we, we've put commitments in place, um, for example, in our malaria vaccine to supply at a not-for-profit price um, uh, with, um, with uh, returns being reinvested into um, future R&D as well. And further to the point around biopreparedness and future epidemic threats, um, the, the biopreparedness organization which GSK has, has put forward um, has, has committed to a no-profit, no-loss model as well. And, and just around the point on incentives, which I think is also well recognized and Jay touched on, um, for vaccines uh, existing on the market, agreements with our international partners like um, Gavi and AMC is a good example. Um, these strong partnership with organizations like UNICEF who then procure the vaccines are critical to enabling us to ensure um, that we can deliver our vaccines at the lowest prices for the use in the world's poorest countries. Um, and as highlighted uh, by John, GSK has really pioneered the tiered pricing approach in our vaccines business, which enables us to offer differentiated prices to those countries according to their social and economic status. And that, that is critical to the long-term sustainability, um, uh, meaning that for non-GAVI countries, this means offering a price uh, reflecting their ability to pay uh, as their, their GNI and the economic and social status of their country. Um, there are exceptional circumstances as well, which I think are pulled out in the report, um, such as GSK's recent commitment to, uh, uh, to civil society organizations who are working with refugees um, to vaccinate populations where governments are, are unable to do so. Just to close, I think uh, a note that uh, there's a common thread in, in the GSK um, report card in the Access to Vaccines Index, but equally throughout the, um, the index findings is that uh, all of our commitments and achievements in the space um, are, are really centered around working in partnership and whether in R&D for our malaria vaccine for the last 30 years and the commitments um, that GSK has been able to make alongside our partners at Path and Gates um, and actually 90% of our, our pipeline vaccines are in partnership or our, our volume agreements with UNICEF and Gavi. Um, 
we, we need to continue to work together in order to address the, the global health challenges of today and, and prepare ourselves uh, in order to be able to innovate uh, for the health solutions for tomorrow. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and hope to engage in some, some questions. And if there's any further information needed, um, please feel free to reach me. Okay. Great. Thank you both. Um, so before handing over to our final speaker, I did just want to remind participants that you can ask questions using the Q&A box. We will get to those after this next presentation. Uh, and if we don't have time, we'll certainly make a note of them and, and try and get them to the speakers following the webinar. Uh, so on that note, I will hand over to our final speaker, Hanukkah Schmidtmacher, who is the head of viral vaccine discovery and translational medicine at Johnson & Johnson. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, we can. You can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, in the next five minutes, I would like to give you a glimpse of the uh, vaccine pipeline or the vaccines with transformational potential that we are working on at in Jensen, uh, uh, the pharma division of J and J. Um, and uh, we are working on differentiated technology platforms and smart science to bring solutions for high unmet needs, uh, especially uh, in this presentation, the programs that sit in our global public health initiatives. So on the next slide. For most of our vaccines, we make use of uh, two core uh, vaccine technology platforms. One of them is the PRISI-6 cell line, which is highly permissive to human viruses and that we use uh, uh, for the uh, manu manufacturing and preparation of uh, uh, viral vaccines. Uh, this platform offers high yield, which allows production at low cost of goods. Um, we have uh, experience with broad manufacturing applications and uh, the good news last year was that one of our licensees of the PRISI-6 platform launched uh, the first product uh, in the EU. We use this platform uh, very often in combination with adenoviral vectors, uh, the EdVec platform, that are common cold viruses that we use as a vehicle to deliver antigens of a pathogen of choice. Um, we have uh, achieved a lot of experience with this platform in our Ebola uh, program. I will show you uh, some exciting data that we achieve on uh, durable uh, immune responses and also in uh, the uh, um, product manufacturing, we have very exciting data of uh, stability at two to eight degrees, which makes it a very compatible uh, product uh, with a, a cold chain not requiring storage at uh, minus 60 degrees, for instance. Um, on the next slide, you can see uh, uh, the Ebola. Next slide, please. Ebola program. Um, where we uh, are currently uh, in, in phase three uh, uh, safety and immunogenicity studies. These are data from the phase one studies that we uh, started uh, when the outbreak was ongoing in Western Africa. And you can see that we have follow-up data with this platform for more than a year now. And even after a year, uh, the immune responses that were elicited by an Adeno Prime and MVA boost, and for this we collaborate with the Bavarian Nordic company who produces the other factor MVA, that we had very uh, durable immune responses both for antibodies and, and T cells. Um, we uh, are uh, doing these programs with external funding. Uh, it started with funding from the US Division of Defense. Uh, we have funding from BARDA and also from the uh, EU IMI. On the next slide, it's a summary of what we have achieved, some of the things I already mentioned. The vaccine has now been used in 2,500 uh, volunteers. We have uh, successfully set up large-scale manufacturing. The platform is performing as promised. We have been able to manufacture 150 doses of Adeno on a 2 times 10 liter scale, so that's still a uh, very low scale and uh, already very high yield and have been able to produce a stockpile of 1.6 million doses uh, uh, that are currently available. And we have submitted the program uh, for emergency use assessment and listing at WHO and are currently discussing with regulators and key stakeholders on how we will finish the job uh, in the absence of a large outbreak. On the next slide, uh, uh, the program that we are also working on is an uh, affordable uh, inactivated polio vaccine. 
is the next slide um, for which we use the Percy 6 cell line. Uh, because we can use uh, the cell line at very high cell density, we can produce at a very small footprint. And you can see here in the green dots on the left side that we achieve tenfold or more than tenfold higher yields with the Percy 6 cell line as compared to the zero cell platform for all three serotypes uh, that are represented in inactivated uh, polio vaccine. And on the right side of the slide, you see uh, that we have similar immunogenicity. In this case, it's uh, in non-human primates, similar immunogenicity as the, the current standard. Um, with this platform, we are aiming for a uh, product that will have a target cost of goods of 50 cents per dose. For those, and the planned uh, phase one study is for the third quarter of this year. We are doing this uh, program with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the last program that I would like to highlight, next slide, is uh, our HIV vaccine program. Next slide, please. Um, where we are working on a global vaccine that will give coverage to all circulating HIV-1 variants in the world. For this, we use uh, the adenoviral vectors, as I mentioned earlier. We have very well designed uh, HIV inserts that uh, will give the global coverage. And we have a very unique uh, protein that can elicit the optimal humoral immune response that we think is needed uh, to get uh, optimal protection. We are doing this program in uh, academic partnership with the Best Israel Deacon Medical Center, and we receive significant funding from uh, the U.S. National Institute of Health, and we have a commitment for future funding from the NIH again and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On the next slide, uh, you can see the data that is uh, currently uh, uh, available. So in a non-human primate model, we have a 66% protection level after six challenges for so 66% of animals are still uh, uh, free of uh, virus uh, after six challenges. This is uh, a very unique outcome because it's three times more efficacious in non-human primates than the vaccine regimen that has shown some efficacy in humans today. So that was the RV144 study. We are currently in a phase uh, one to a study where we are selecting the regimen and uh, looking for sufficient uh, magnitude of responses to uh, justify a go decision. And the data of this uh, study will be presented at the IAS in, in Paris of July uh, of this year. And we are preparing for a phase to be proof of concept study uh, in sub-Saharan African uh, countries to see whether, uh, if of course we reach the, the go no go criteria, to see whether our regimen indeed has, indeed has protective potential uh, in, in human beings. So on the last slide, uh, we are uh, uh, realizing our potential uh, by using uh, our technology platforms that, that likely have transformational potential both in prophylactic and therapeutic indications. The data from our clinical studies support transformational potential and proof of concept studies will start in the next six to 18 months also for uh, other uh, vaccine programs that I could not discuss today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hanukkah. So uh, we'll now move to the um, Q&A section, and we've had a few questions come in. Um, so the first one that I'll start with, um, and Guy and John, I might hand this one over to you uh, to start with, is Pharma companies often seem to be quite good at increasing access in the least developed countries, but less so in middle income countries where high levels of income inequality and poverty can often exist. So what do the findings from the Access to Vaccines Index suggest about company approaches in these countries? Can you hear me? Uh, oh, perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll start. I don't, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Yeah. And then, John, maybe you can add. So, uh, as I said, I think the key, um, from a vaccine's perspective, the, the key approach uh, that GSK takes is, is our tiered pricing approach. So that essentially enables us to, to offer differentiated prices to countries according to their specific social and economic status. 
um, and that actually that's critical in enabling us to, to continue to deliver those very lowest prices to Gavi countries in the in the high volumes that we do, uh, and and maintain the long term sustainability of our of our business. Um, having said that, I think there are exceptional circumstances, a number of which. Uh, impact middle-income countries, uh, and and I, I suppose the first caveat to make is that middle-income countries are extremely uh, heterogeneous across the board, and so I think um, it's important to recognise that that point. But there are there are exceptional circumstances where we have taken uh, exceptional approaches, and I I think the the example of that is the, the current refugee crisis, and where we've we've offered our uh, essential. Um, vaccines to to CSOs, uh, civil society organisations who are working to vaccinate refugees where the governments are unable to do so. Um, the, the other area where we've we've made a commitment um, which has a an impact on uh, a large number of lower middle income countries with a uh, with the highest um, burden of of, disease, of vaccine preventable diseases is actually our uh, commitment to freeze our GAVI prices for those countries. For 10 years following their transition from GAVI support, meaning that uh, as they uh, transition into middle income country status, as a number of them already have, they maintain access to those GAVI prices for, uh, for the subsequent um, 10 years um, for existing GSK vaccines. Um, John, I don't know if you have any, any comments to add. Guy, very comprehensive answer, nothing to add. Great, and unless any of the other speakers have anything that they want to add. Um, no, okay, I might move on to the next question. Um, so the next question is how and why uh, were these companies chosen for the Access to Vaccines Index? And um, is there an aim to include more companies in the next index? So Jay, I think that's a question for you. Great, well, thanks for that question. So. Um, what we did is we built a methodology around um, the most important and relevant companies uh, in terms of the potential to improve uh, vaccine uh, access. And we use uh, uh, basically um, a matrix of uh, the highest uh, um, revenue generators, uh, the ones that had a relevant pipeline for the priority pathogens, um, and the companies that, um, that had a interesting uh, portfolio of, of projects um, in order to identify the companies. Um, and that led us to eight companies that, that pretty much was an important sample size for, um, for, for this particular analysis. Uh, we definitely have the ambition to continue this work because obviously, you know, and for those who know our work, um, you know, progress tracking requires uh, also commitment from the trackers to say, you know, we're going we're gonna to evaluate this over time and and, and, and see the change, uh, real change over, over multiple years itself. So we definitely have that interest. Uh, right now we are watching the uh, field very closely, interacting with um, various different stakeholders to understand what some of the mechanisms are at play for making the progress and, and improvements. So we're, uh, we're perhaps looking at a longer cycle before the next iteration of the vaccine index would, would be uh, playing a role in. Um, we are, of course, reaching out to other companies also to inform them about the results of the Access to Vaccines Index and try to encourage them to track their own progress in this particular path and uh, reach out to us to participate in, in a future edition of the Access to Vaccines Index. Great. Thank you, Jay. Um, and I might try and squeeze in one more question before the end. So, um, Lauren, this is a question for you on um, investor reactions to initiatives such as the Access to Vaccines Index. So the question is, uh, have companies seen more shareholder resolutions on the topic to encourage them to, to take on such initiatives? Or even has there been um, an increase in divestment for not being a participant in uh, initiatives such as Access to Vaccines? Mm. It's a complicated question. Um, I would say in terms of shareholder resolutions, no, I do think there's an increase in actual dialogue. I think you're seeing um, U.S. action on drug price transparency, which is a whole different uh, ballgame um, here in the U.S., and that has, um, you have seen an increase. 
increase in, in resolutions. I would say I would say this index, um, and in terms of investor uh, demand for this type of information, it just is part of the the overall arching sort of evolution of investor expectations of short versus long term kind of focus, and especially as many of the pharmaceutical company. Um, uh, revenue growth and profitability um, in, in you know kind of future um, forward looking is really from some of those markets and and so access strategies um, linked to business model um, is very is key um, to kind of not only reducing uh, risk but frankly also availing ourselves of, of the opportunities in those markets great thank you Lauren um, so as we are one minute past the hour, I will wrap up. Um, there were one or two questions that didn't get answered, so I will make note of those and send them to our speakers. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for attending this webinar today and to all of our speakers for their presentations. Uh, as Jay said at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the Access to Vaccines report, the key findings and all the company scorecards can be found um, online, so I would encourage everyone to uh, have a more more thorough look at those. Um, so thank you very much, and I'll end it there.